morning and welcome as we gather together on this Sunday morning and as we prepare our hearts and minds, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord God, luminous, dancing, fountain of Easter, we give you thanks as we gather in this place to celebrate your love for us and for our broken world. Come among us with your power and bind us together as your people. Enable us to go forth into the world with great grace, empowered as those who have seen and believed. We lift up all of these things as we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come and share the ample treasure of new life in Christ. We celebrate our unity as God's people. Christ has died and Christ is risen. Christ is with us forevermore. Christ is our advocate, our helper, our comforter in times of need.
Today's affirmation of faith is an affirmation from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 6 and Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen. At this time, as we gather together, let us take a few moments and to remember names and situations that we lift up with our joys and concerns. And we will have a brief moment of silent prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading comes from the book of Acts in chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power and 
the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as they had need. A dad saw his children on the front porch and asked what they were doing. We are playing church, they answered. The father said, it doesn't look like it. The children replied, you came in at the end. We have already worshipped. Now we are out on the front steps smoking. A lot of people remember this joke as one of the first bits of church humor they ever heard, but it was true to life. What do people see when they look at our church? We may or may not want to know what people see and think about our church. Those who look from the outside usually see us church people in less flattering ways than we see ourselves. Our reading for today describes the early church in Jerusalem. Theirs isn't necessarily a model for all Christians to follow, but in terms of time and geography, the Jerusalem church was closest to our origins. So we Christians of whatever era would do well to lean in and learn from this congregation. In Jerusalem, we see a group of Christians who are highly energized. They feel a connection of the Holy Spirit and display that energy. They are focused and determined to follow the leading of the Spirit. An immediate showing of this energy is their boldness. In fact, boldness in witness is a key theme in the first half of the book of Acts. Our reading says that the Jerusalem church testified with great power in verse 33. When we compare their witness with that of the church today, there is a difference. Today, a lot of Christians are uncomfortable witnessing to their faith. Is it any wonder that our churches are declining? Another evidence of the high energy of the Jerusalem church is the unusual quality of their fellowship. Luke says they were one of heart and soul to such an extent that they held all property in common. That doesn't describe most congregations in America today. Certainly not in our materialistic, individualistic, and pleasure-seeking society. Something had clearly happened to these followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. They weren't living as they had before they were joined together by the Holy Spirit in love. They were fulfilling Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, verse 23, that his followers would become completely one and would be filled with Jesus' joy. For us today, Christian unity, spiritual oneness, isn't a priority. It isn't a priority within our congregations or among religious groups. We prize our individualism and see religion as an individual, private matter. We believe that the work of religion is to service the needs of individuals, make them happy or successful, or give them peace of mind. One modern metaphor for the church is the gas station. It is where we go to get spiritual fuel for the weak. Division within or among the churches doesn't matter. If we don't get along, we will part company. And the more gas stations, the better. But the New Testament has a different view of the church. It sees things corporately, not individually. It believes that the church has a mission. When you have a mission, division hurts. It undercuts the work of the church, 
Division is a sign that Christians aren't living their faith and have no credibility. The first job of the church is to create a loving community in a divided world. It is not, if it is not doing this, then it is not yet the church. Community and unity are essential to the church. They aren't add-ons or extras. The church must always practice forgiveness and reconciliation. People cannot be a part of a church and live out of harmony with their neighbors. In Chicago in 1977, Kathleen Webb accused Gary Dotson, as far as I know, he is of no relation, of committing a crime against her. Gary Dotson was convicted and sent to prison. In 1985, Kathleen Webb announced that she had lied. She said that she had met Jesus Christ, joined a church, and wanted to make amends based on her new lifestyle. Webb knew that she had to set things right. When people meet Jesus Christ, a change happens. Their indifference and dishonesty are replaced with a new kind of caring. This caring is not an option for Christians. As we have said, one of the indicators of the high energy of the Jerusalem church was that they held all property in common. This arrangement arose from how they felt about each other. If you need something and I have it, why should I hold it back? There is an old tale that you may have heard before. It is about two brothers who inherited a farm. They decided to farm the land together and split the harvest. One brother married and had children while the other never married. The single brother recognized that his brother had more mouths to feed, so an equal split wasn't fair. The married brother realized that his brother had no one to provide for him in his old age, so an equal split wasn't fair. So every night, each brother slipped over to the other's barn and emptied several bags of grain. One night, the brothers bumped into each other and realized what was happening. They fell into each other's arms. A gentle rain began to fall, and the rain was God's tears of joy. This story is a long way from where we are in society today. We value individualism and private ownership. Our goal is to get more and more for ourselves. A huge gap has opened up between the haves and the have-nots. Yet, every day, we hear angry voices of well-off politicians and commentators who want to keep the status quo. They want to retain their right to make greater and greater profits. They have little interest in helping others get out of poverty or get medical care. Their high energy is directed toward private ownership and their own consumption. The example of the Jerusalem church speaks to us. These early Christians were simply as concerned about their neighbor's well-being as they were about their own. Their first job was to create a loving community in a divided world. This kind of community may be a pipe dream or it may reflect a love into which we haven't fully grown. It is a wonderful thought that there could yet be an outbreak of this new kind of caring across our land today. If so, it has to come from us. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up
Until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. In the goodness of God. Thank you for joining us today, and as we get ready to go out and begin a new week, let us go to God in prayer. Today, brothers and sisters, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. How great and powerful it is when they go forth to serve. Let us leave this place knowing ourselves to be bearers of God's peace and instruments of God's love. Amen.